Greetings, YouTubers. I'm Rick, the tech enthusiast here with the next Alugu lesson number nine, servo and rotary encoder. In this lesson, we'll become familiar with the servo SG90 provided it with the Elegoo kit and how we can use it with the Arduino for our projects. We'll build and configure a simple circuit to demonstrate the functionality. And then we'll build a range control circuit using a rotary encoder, an OLED, and an RGB. So let's start building. First, let's start out with a brief overview of the servo. Servos have integrated gears, a shaft, and integrated controller to precisely control the angle of movement. Standard servos allow the shaft to be positioned anywhere between 0 and 180 degrees. Continuous rotation servos allow the rotation of the shaft to be set to various speeds. The servo in our kit is designed to rotate 180 degrees. We'll control the servo angle by sending a specific pulse width from the Arduino or other microcontroller. The width of the pulse determines the servo angle. The servo has three wires. Brown is for ground, red is for 5 volts, and the orange is the signal wire. The tutorial has some information on the servo, but I'll include some additional links if you're interested and encourage you to check it out. For this lesson, we'll need the following items from your kit. The Elogu Arduino Uno R3 board, the SG90 servo, three male-to-male -male jumper wires, and that's it. On page 77, you'll see the following schematic. Super simple. On page 78, you'll see the wiring diagram. On page 79, there's a photo. I should point out that we're not going to use a breadboard. We're simply going to connect the jumper wires to the servo and to the Arduino board. Okay, let's jump to the code. As before, we'll load the recommended sketch provided in the tutorial. Go to the File menu item, Open, and browse to where you save the Elegoo files. Then under your language, Code, under Lesson 9 Servo, Servo, and open the servo.ino file. Looking at the code, you see that we'll be using the servo.h library. Now, this should be installed with the latest Arduino IDE, my version being 1.8. Otherwise, it's available under the Elegoo tutorial files. To verify, go to the sketch menu item, select the include library, and you should see if you have the servo already installed. If you need to add it, select add zip library, go to where you saved your Elegoo files under your language, under libraries, and you should see the servo.zip. Select it and click the open button. I have it, so I'll hit cancel for now. Once you have it installed, I think you should be able to use it. The next line instantiates the my servo with the servo class object. Then we have a global variable POS or position, which will be used to store the servo position. Under the void setup, we attach a hard coded pin 9 to my servo. The void loop consists of two for loops to rotate the servo from 0 to 180 degrees and back again. The little delay slows down the rotation for a smooth rotation. Super simple. Hmm. I know I like to update the code, so let me make one small change before we begin. I think it's a good habit to define the pin as a constant. That way, if you make changes, you simply change the pin location in one place. So I'll add a constant int servo pin and make it equal nine. Then I'll replace the hard-coded number with the servo pin. Okay, I'm happier. Let's upload the code and try it out.
As you can see, the servo rotates wildly. Why do you suppose it does that? Well, if I take a look at the library, the servo.h file is nicely commented, and we find that the default pulse sizes are between 544 and 2400 microseconds. Now, looking at the data sheet, it seems that it recommends values somewhere in between 1000 and 2000 for maximum rotation. The servo library accepts two forms of code for the setup. The one we originally used and another that allows us to include a minimum and maximum pulse width values in microseconds. Let's enter the values from the data sheet and upload the sketch. Hmm. Now the servo seems to rotate just uh, about 90 degrees or so. I guess the values in the data sheet are incorrect. Huh. I guess I'll repeat the process several times and use trial and error to determine the maximum swing of our servo. Finally, I found that my servo, our servo in the kit, comfortably rotates between 625 and 2625 microseconds. But if we use this in the sketch, we can see that the rotation isn't 180 degrees. Well, that's because the instruction in the setup binds the servo to that range. The servo library just maps 180 degree range with the provided values we gave it. Sure, we could tweak the ranges in the for loops to get the satisfying 180 degree rotation, but there's a better way. Let's make a circuit that allows us to adjust the rotation until we get the 180 degrees that we want. I want it to rotate back and forth and allow me to adjust the ends of the swing. It would even be cooler if it had a display that actually showed you the current pulse width and the minimum and maximum. Shoot, let's throw in an LED and give us a visual indication of where we are in the process. Here's the schematic. There's a lot going on here, so let's start with the servo. The servo connects to the 5 volts and the ground buses on the breadboard and the signal to pin 2. The OLED connects to pins 13 through 9 and the power and ground buses. You should note that my actual uh, OLED doesn't look like the one here in the Fritzing software. I couldn't find anything closer, so please excuse me for my, uh, my crudeness here. The rotary encoder connects through 10k ohm resistors to the Arduino pins A0, A1, and pin 3 and the power and ground buses. I also included 22 picofarad caps for pin A and B and a 0.01 microfarad cap from the switch to the ground bus. I decided to use the RGB LED to provide visual indication using 220 ohm resistors to pin 7, 6, and 5. Here you can see the components laid out on the breadboard. The jumpers to the LED run underneath the display. Let me be honest, I did a whole lot of trial and error to get this thing to work. Getting the rotary encoder to work properly, that was probably the most difficult part. You see, the rotary encoder has two internal switches that get switched on and off at different times, depending on which direction you turn the knob. The resulting output looks like this. As you can see, the output pins are exactly a quarter cycle shifted compared to one another. If you turn the encoder clockwise or forward, you can see the current state for pin A is high or 1, and pin B is low or 0. As it moves along the timeline, pin A stays high or 1, and B goes to high or 1. So if the last pin A is high, and the last pin B is low, 
and the current pin A is high and the current B pin is high, then we're moving clockwise one step, which would lead to a very complicated if then else statement. But if we translate this into binary, we have 1011 equals a positive one rotation. This allows us to generate the truth table for both directions and figure out which direction the encoder is being rotated. So how does this help us code for the encoder? The truth is that the switching action happens so quickly that a fast detection routine is needed to accurately capture all the states from pins A and B. And yes, I had to learn this the hard way. At first, there was a lot of switch bouncing that caused problems. I tried just debouncing each pin with software, you know, like the one we created in the digital inputs lesson number five. But the delay caused inconsistent results in incorrect rotational movement. Well, that's because the software is just too slow and the delay just compounded the problem. So I replaced the debounce code with a resistor and a capacitor. However, I was still using simple function calls and a really long if then else statement to determine the movement. Again, a big fail. Here's where the truth table helps us. I was able to reduce all of the if then else logic to a single array table. And I added fast low level coding to grab the bit values. It worked, well, at least better. I really needed to use interrupts to capture the switch states, but I was already using an interrupt by the push button. If I use interrupts zero and two, I would have killed the serial port. Huh, the answer lies with using the pin change interrupt feature. You can find a bunch of info on the web, but briefly a pin change interrupt creates a common interrupt for a set of pins. Well, in my case, I chose pins A0 through A5. It was away from the servo pin and the OLED. The common interrupt calls a single ISR. So the encoder pins must also share an interrupt service routine. And here's another trick. Keep the code in the ISR to a minimum. Hmm. Perhaps I'll create a rotary encoder lesson in the future. One more thing. I'm using the OLED that I recently purchased. It's a SPI version rather than the I squared C. There are trade-offs to each and I'll cover that in a future lesson. You can make this sketch work with just a serial monitor, but the display adds a nice touch. Let's jump into the code. Okay. I included a significant amount of comments here to help anyone reading the sketch. I start by including two libraries this time, the Servo and the U8G2 library. Both were installed by the Arduino IDE. However, I'll include a link in the show notes below if you need the U8G2 library. The U8G2 library is an upgraded version of the older U8G library. Then this line is instantiates my servo as a servo class object. The next grouping of global constants defines the pins used for the OLED. The long line that starts with U8G2 instantiates the U8G2 object. The first parameter in this sets the rotation. The remaining parameters are the pin connections. I left in all the comments to help me and any readers of the sketch. The next grouping of constants define the rotary encoder pins, servo pins, and the RGB LED pins. Then I have a set of global variables to store the initial minimum and maximum values and the minimum and maximum positions that we'll adjust to. The volatile variables are used in conjunction with the interrupt routines. Volatile variables are stored in a different area of memory to prevent loss during an interrupt command. The last two variables handle the rotation direction and the LED maximum brightness. The void PCI setup is called just during setup routine, which is why I added it up here. These commands enable the pin change interrupt to the pins that are passed onto it. More on that in the void setup. Under the void setup, we start by setting up the my servo object 
with the pin and maximum and minimum values that we found earlier in microseconds. The pin change interrupt and later the byte pin read command affects the entire block of pins. So I used a for loop to set them all up as input and use the pull up resistors. The encoder switch is on pin three, so I can use it later with interrupt two. The remaining pin modes set the LED pins as output. Now I set the interrupts. The first attach interrupt command is for the push button switch on the encoder. The next two call the PCI setup to start pin change interrupt for pins A0 and A1. The serial begin sets up the serial monitor. Initially, I changed the baud rate because I was worried about speed, but I think the 9600 baud may work. Just be sure to adjust your serial monitor to whatever speed you're using. Set color calls the function we made in lesson four to turn the RGB LED to green. Next, I go through the various pin modes to set the OLED pins and start the UAG2 with a begin statement. And finally, I send several lines of text to the serial monitor to let the user know what's going on. You may not need it, the OLED displays just about everything we need to know, but if you don't have a display, it can still work for you. Okay, that was the busiest setup I've done so far. On to the void loop. The void loop consists of a large if statement. The Boolean value E button is controlled by the encoder switch. If E button is true, the button was pushed. So go into adjustment mode. Otherwise, rotate the servo in the full min-max position. The other serial print lines inform the user what they're about to do. Set color changes the RGB LED to a different color to help indicate where they are in the process. And the while loop keeps it in an adjustment mode until the encoder button is pushed again. Here, the delay gives the user time to press the encoder or wait to rotate again. Void draw is used to refresh the OLED with the latest current position and provide visual indication of what mode they are in. Most interesting is that I have included an optional past parameter indicator. The indicator will be used when adjusting the min and max positions and when in the normal current position. For this sketch, I decided to use the page buffer method. So it starts with the line u8g2.first page. Then I have all the commands to display everything. And it ends with a while u8g2 next page. The stuff in the middle starts with the font size and font type that I want to use. It is then followed by the lines of text and their X and Y screen positions. Fairly simple. I use two different methods to draw lines and I draw a disk to provide the GUI indication value. The past indicator parameter determines the location of the disk. Cool. The set color function is a stripped down version from lesson four. It sets the RGB LED color. The turn servo function does just what the title says. It turns the servo to the pass parameter position in microseconds. It also has two optional parameters, indicator and skip. The function does the work in calling the draw function above and turning the servo. As I was testing this, refreshing the screen after each position increment was terribly slow. So I included a skip feature to automatically skip the draw command. We override the command with the first if statement. So as it gets closer to the endpoints, it'll show the current position. The void servo rotates 
rotates the servo through the min and max positions, either in one direction or the other, depending on a Boolean value. I also included a feature to flash the LED after every 60 positions. The void do encoder has gone through the most changes as I was writing the sketch. Here you see the final version, which grabs the current position, calculates the mid position, then adds the rotary encoder rotations from the volatile variable E counter. Once it adds it, it resets the E counter. And then with the help of an if statement, verifies the new value and adjusts the min and max position variables. It also makes the call to turn servo function to actually turn the servo. Fairly simple. Finally, we get to the ISR functions or the service routines. These are called whenever the Arduino receives an interrupt from the button switch or the rotary encoder. The trick is to keep these functions short, fast, and simple. The void E button ISR sets the volatile boolean E button to true. That's it. The ISR PC INT1 underscore VECT is the routine called by either of the encoder pins. Don't let the comments fool you. It's short and sweet. The larger comments describe how I came about the values found in the lookup table array, which by the way, is static. Static variables like this are remembered when the function is called again. So in the next line, the variable ENC val's value is remembered each time the interrupt is activated. The next line shifts the number value as a binary two places to the left. We'll use this trick to store the pin history. Now here's the really tricky part. My truth table is arranged by pin A and pin B. When you connect your jumpers, notice that pin A is on A1 and pin B is on A0. The next line makes a call to PINC, which is a specific call to grab all the values from the pins A0 through A5. But it's an order of A5, A4, A3, A2, A1, A0. That's why the pins are connected the way they are. So I have the bits in the order we want them to be. Anyhow, we end a bit mask binary 1 1 to hide all the other bits that we don't want. Then we or it to the historical ENC val. So now we just created the index for our lookup table. Excellent. Since a byte is 8 bits long, we take the new ENC val and end it to a binary 1 1 1 1 to strip out all the other bits away. The array lookup table returns the rotation value, and the rotation value is added to the E counter. Okay, here's the circuit. I found an old knob to fit on top of the rotary encoder shaft. That should make it easier to turn. I also took the liberty to remove the OLED so you can see the display pins directly line up with those on the Arduino. Sorry for any confusion on the wiring diagrams. Otherwise, you can see that the circuit is very similar to the wiring diagram. I'll also add a large pointer to aid in the servo direction. Oh, quickly, I thought I'd show you the circuit with the screen on the breadboard and the pointer on the servo. Okay, let's upload the sketch and see how it works. I'll turn on the serial monitor so we can see the output. Okay, a message comes up on the serial monitor providing the user with the information and begins rotating the servo. You can see the OLED's current position has an indicator above it while the number value increments and the servo rotates to 180 degrees. Notice that I had the RGB LED blinking red to tell the user to wait 
Once it stops, it turns green for three seconds and begins rotating again, turning back to a blinking red LED. Okay, we'll press the encoder button while it's green. Press the encoder button while it's green. The RGB LED changes to yellow and waits for me to adjust the servo. Notice that the indicator changed to the minimum position. while both the minimum and the current positions are incremented. Once I'm happy with the result, I press the encoder button again. And the RGB LED changes back to blinking red and begins rotating again. Now I repeat the steps for the maximum value. Keep repeating until we have our full 180 degrees. Once we're happy with the range of motion, we have the minimum and maximum values to use in our future servo projects. There'll be no need to use a map function or tweak the degree position to get what we want. It might even be a good idea to add this information to the datasheet. Excellent, it works. Well, that's it for this lesson. I hope you've enjoyed learning a little about the SG90 servo, the rotary encoder, and the OLED. If you like this sketch, be sure to let me know in the comments section below. I'll have additional links for other interesting videos and the code for this project in the show notes below. Join me next time for lesson 10, ultrasonic sensor module. If you like this video, don't forget to rate and subscribe. I'll try to put out a new video each week. Thanks and I'll see you next time.